In this video, we're going to cover two methods for the vicinal dihydroxylation or 1,2 dihydroxylation of alkenes. These reactions or sequences of reactions, as we'll see, install two OH groups on the two carbons of an alkene. And this is highly useful synthetically for installing some oxidation, installing an electronegative functional group on the two carbons of an alkene. The first approach, which ultimately leads to anti dihydroxylation, stereospecific anti-dihydroxylation of an alkene, involves the formation of an epoxide. We'll talk about epoxides a little bit later in Organic Chemistry 1 in more detail. For now, all we need to know is that a, an epoxide is a three-membered cyclic ether with an oxygen atom and two carbon atoms in a ring like so. And one of the most common approaches for epoxidation, formation of an epoxide, involves treatment of an alkene with a per-carboxylic acid. Now, per-carboxylic acids are a little bit trippy in structure, so they're worth discussing here briefly. A per-carboxylic acid is like a carboxylic acid, which would contain a carbonyl group, C double bond O, linked to an OH group, with an extra oxygen jammed between the carbonyl carbon and the hydroxyl group. So notice here, instead of having an OH here, they have an OOH. And that extra oxygen that's sort of jammed between the OH group and the carbonyl group is the oxygen that's transferred to the alkene in epoxidation reactions. The two most common reagents for electrophilic epoxidation with per acids of alkenes are per acetic acid, in which case this R group is simply a methyl group, and a rather unique reagent called metachloroperbenzoic acid, or MCPBA for short. You'll hear people refer to this as MCPBA because metachloroperbenzoic acid is a mouthful. Um, this can also be used to epoxidize alkenes. And the byproduct in all of these reactions is the carboxylic acid. The per acid in which that extra oxygen is now missing, it's been transferred to the alkene such that we end up with a carboxylic acid. Now, how does this work mechanistically? This is actually highly analogous to halogenations, the formation of a halonium ion from X2 and an alkene. So these curved arrows look like an absolute mess, but I want to draw your attention to the analogy here between the electron flow for formation of a halonium ion and the electron flow we're seeing here. We noted that halogens can be thought of as electrophiles, right? We can have a nucleophile attack at one of the halogen atoms and the XX bond break kicking off an X minus leaving group. We actually see two very similar arrows in this electron flow with the alkene donating a pair of electrons to this oxygen and the OO bond breaking toward the rest of the molecule looking like a leaving group. We also noted that the halogen will rebound and form a bond in the sort of opposite direction to form the three-membered ring in a single elementary step. The same thing happens in epoxidation with per acids. This oxygen that's part of the hydroxyl group rebounds with a lone pair forming a bond to the carbon that would have been positively charged without this rebound kind of step. The only difference in electrophilic epoxidations with per acids is that instead of simply landing a pair of electrons right here and creating a carboxylate anion, the per acid actually has the ability to flow electrons around to pick off this proton, generating a neutral carboxylic acid as the leaving group as opposed to a carboxylate. And this all happens in one go such that this oxygen is transferred to the alkene. I'm realizing I may have misspoke a little bit earlier in that it's actually the hydroxyl type oxygen, this oxygen here on the end that's transferred to the alkene. The carboxylate group right here ends up linked to this hydrogen in the carboxylic acid byproduct. But in any event, the key thing here really to understand is this analogous electron flow in both cases. Nucleophilic attack by the alkene and this rebound electron flow are exactly the same thing as what's going on in a halonium formation elementary step. And this is highly analogous to a hal halonium ion structurally. The two carbons of the epoxide ring are electrophilic. The oxygen is a good leaving group. This would alleviate ring strain. And that oxygen can support some negative charge. And so 
Like helonium ions, epoxides are good electrophiles, and this is the basis of the anti dihydroxylation approach. What we're going to do next is exactly analogous to that inversion of configuration when X minus opens a helonium ion in a halogenation reaction. Epoxides, as it turns out, are much more stable than helonium ions, and so we often will make the epoxide with, say, MCPBA, isolate it, and then if we want anti dihydroxylation, the next step is to use aqueous acid to open the epoxide stereospecifically via an SN2 step. The idea here mechanistically is that the acid will protonate the oxygen of the epoxide producing its conjugate acid right here. All we did here was a proton transfer step and then water can come in and open this protonated epoxide which is much more electrophilic and this occurs with inversion of configuration so that the two OH groups end up on opposite sides of the five-membered ring in this case. There's an anti-addition of the two OH groups as a result of this inversion of configuration. As in halogenation reactions, this can occur at either electrophilic carbon of the protonated epoxide. It's an SN2 step in both cases, but it leads to these two enantiomers and we, we'd expect a racemic mixture in this case. And this is actually not the second, but the third time we've seen electron flow like this. The protonated epoxide, which is highly electrophilic at these two carbons, is analogous to a bromonium ion. We've seen Br- attacking this carbon and water in halohydrin formation. And the mercurinium ion, which we previously saw in oxymercuration, demercuration reactions with water coming in to open this ion as well. So water acting as a nucleophile in all three of these, uh, toward all three of these reactive intermediates is something we've seen before. And drawing an analogy between these three reactions will help you remember and apply how they work much more easily. And so the net result overall of these two steps is anti-dihydroxylation of the starting alkene. First, we form an epoxide using something like peracetic acid, and then we open that epoxide stereospecifically with inversion of configuration where water attacks to give anti 1,2-dihydroxy uh, products. If we want syn-dihydroxylation with the two new hydroxyl groups on the same side, of the alkene, we have to use a fundamentally different approach. And the approach here makes use of osmium tetroxide or potassium permanganate, these oxyanions, metallic oxyanions, that can deliver two oxygens at once from the same side of the alkene to both alkene carbons. Now, OSO4 is fantastic for this, but osmium is extremely toxic. And so most commonly, the OSO4 is actually used in catalytic quantities in combination with N-methylmorpholine N-oxide, this compound right here, which we'll abbreviate just as NMO. This is an oxidant that essentially turns over the osmium so that it can continue, OSO4 is continuously regenerated, even though it's there only in catalytic quantities. And uh, alternatively to all of that, we can use cold potassium permanganate, KMnO4, together with basic KOH at cold temperature. And this is important to avoid actually cleavage of the carbon-carbon bond entirely and, and over oxidation of the alkene. The low temperature is necessary for this. We won't talk about this mechanism in too much detail, but we do want to explain the syn stereospecificity here, the fact that only this product is observed and we don't see any anti 1,2 dihydroxy product. The syn stereospecificity is explained by the fact that both carbon oxygen bonds form at the same time through electron flow like this. This kind of cyclic electron flow is called pericyclic. And you'll probably, you may talk more about this in your Organic Chemistry 2 course. For the time being, this is about the only pericyclic elementary step that we'll see in Organic Chemistry 1. And the important point is that both carbon-oxygen bonds are formed at the same time via this electron flow. Use of base on workup or in the reaction mixture, for example, in this case, causes hydrolysis of this um, cyclic ester with a retention of configuration. And so with both carbon-oxygen bonds forming at the same time, we get syn addition to form this intermediate, and then the subsequent hydrolysis doesn't mess with these carbons at all. They're not even really directly involved. The metal is involved. And so the product we get after retention of configuration here is the syn 
one, two dihydroxy product. So notice the stereochemical difference between this and the anti-dihydroxylation method that went through, an, alke uh, through a, an epoxide where we epoxidized first and then opened with acidic water. Here we can take one step using something like OSO4 and NMO or potassium permanganate in base at zero degrees C to get the SEN dihydroxylation product.